So I'm Valerie Chow. I use she/her pronouns. I work here at the Hot Center on the Carnal Porter team, um, where I'm basically responsible for the summer fellowships for Schneider. Hi everyone. I'm Ben Weissman. Please let me know if you can't hear me in the back. I got a boot on, so I'll be seated. <laughs> Uh, I am the program director on the Cardinal Careers team here at the Haas Center, which means that my primary charge and reason for being at this meeting is for the one-year Schneider Fellowship. Um, so we will share more information about those things. Um, so just some brief background about the Schneider Fellowship. So there's a summer component to it. The summer fellowships are 12 weeks and they're full-time, meaning 35 to 40 hours per week. And we have six partner host organizations that we have worked with for a number of years. Um, and then there's a stipend involved, it's a $10,000 stipend. And then there's up to an additional $1,500 if you're doing some commuting via public transport or if you have a professional travel opportunity during the summer. So, you know, that that is available to you if you're doing those kinds of things. Um, but that's kind of the structure of the summer opportunity. And for the one year long, it is a 12 month engagement. This is full time work. Uh, over the course of those 12 months, the, the one year Shiner Fellowship always places or has always placed at the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, which has regional offices in those four locations. Uh, the stipend is a bit determined by experience. They, they retain that, but it has been about 65 or was last year, plus benefits. Uh, they, they basically are taking you on as an employee for that for that term with a very strong track record of offering a continuation of the role thereafter. Um, and then the application process, the deadline is January 28th for both summer and year long. We don't do extensions, so that is a hard deadline. Um, and then what that entails uh, varies a little bit depending on the host organizations. Uh, two of the summer ones are going to ask for three sh very short essay questions, and then the rest, if you're asking for cover letter, tailored to the, if there are multiple positions, you have to tailor the cover letter to the position that you're applying for. Resume, transcript, um, only USGBC this year, the Green Building Council is asking for two reference names, not letters, just a name of somebody who can, you know, speak on uh, your behalf. Um, the rest are not needing any references or um, red letters this year, much easier process actually um, than years past. So that's kind of the summer application as well. It looks like it's live right now. Yeah, and for the year long, which is a little bit more of a investment in terms of time and energy and mentorship, there is a slightly larger ask in terms of the application itself. So there are two recommendation letters asked for uh, typically, we recommend one being a professional reference and one being an academic reference, show that balance, um, in addition to a writing sample. A lot of writing is involved in this role, uh, working at NRDC, being able to put the idea, ideas into writing, inform policy in different ways. Um, so a short writing sample, of, I think that could be an excerpt of something larger, is the ask there. Uh, but yes, these processes are pretty synced up, and the idea is that we are collecting these applications uh, to then send to these respective employers, to these different NGOs, to review themselves and to take it from there, which is to say offering interviews, things like that is all handled by the employer. So we are the intermediary. We're collecting these things in order to distribute them. Um, and then for the rest of the timeline, so you will uh, apply by January 28th, and then the host organizations will decide who they would like to interview, and the interviews will take place February 18th to 24th. Um, and then the offers will be made by early March. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and you can always reach out to us if you have a question about the status of your application. Um, and then for the summer positions, you have to start by June 16th or 17th or the week after June 23rd. This is a 12 week long commitment. So we do ask that you start pretty much right away after finals. There's a little bit more flexibility with the year long role. Uh, that would be something that you and HR or a direct manager uh, would figure out as a start date. The two fellows that are currently working negotiated start dates that made sense for them, given the fact that they're both starting grad school the year following. So it made sense to start a little earlier so they can end a little earlier so they could have a time before returning to school. So August, September, but to be determined between you and your direct report. Yeah, so summer fellowships are available for some frequently asked questions. You can apply to multiple opportunities. So for the summer, there's six host orgs. 
You can apply to all six if you feel so moved. <laughs> I don't need to, but you, you can. Um, and then within, so for the ones that have multiple positions like EDF and then RDC, you can rank three of them. So there are nine positions at EDF. You have to pick three and rank those three and then submit three couple letters, basically up to three. You don't have to. Um, NRDC, same kind of situation. Um, so like I said, the applications are kind of similar, Some, but then some are cover letters and some are um, essays. Um, and then Ben can talk about the rest of the letters. Yeah, so I, I mentioned this briefly. So there are two letters of recommendation asked for in the year-long year -long Schneider Fellowship application. Uh, I'm glad to answer more questions about this, but like I said, one academic, one professional is the typical ask for this fellowship and other fellowships I run. Uh, the idea being someone that that each of these would be individuals who can attest to your academic abilities. It does not need to be someone with the title professor. It could be a lecturer, instructor, someone who can who has seen you work in an academic setting that can that can write about that in your alignment with the role in that way. And a professional reference being likely a former supervisor, manager of yours, someone who can attest to your ability, capacity to work, be managed, work uh, in an environment in a collaborative team, say outside of an academic setting, especially. So that's the sort of balance that we like to strike and we like to recommend with the letters of rec. Um, yeah, and then for the uh, U.S. Green Building Council, it's just two names, like I said. They don't have to write anything. They will contact the reference if you get far enough in the process to, to kind of check on, you know, some questions. Um, but you should ask for permission before you put somebody's name on your application. And that's just good practice in general when you're asking for references. Um, and it can, like what Ben said, applies here. It doesn't have to be a big title person at Stanford. It can be somebody who you want to be professional capacity, or somebody who just knows you well. Yeah, I, to, I would just encourage you for anyone that you think of as a reference, potential letter of recommendation for this process or any future process, set up a time to chat with them. Like truly, truly. And the subject line of that invitation, I don't think should be, please write my letter. It should be, hey, I'd really love to like do an informational interview, learn more about how you've made career decisions in your career. If this is a person that you would want to be a mentor for you, a letter writer for you going forward, whatever step, like do plant the seed of that relationship, of that curiosity to be able to reciprocate and share what you're interested in because they're going to want to help you do good things that serve the public interest as well. Um, so yes, this is just an endorsement to let your mentors know what you're thinking about, what you're excited about. And ask them to write that letter well, on the basis of that relationship. Yes. Ask them now yes. instead of like, like the day before exactly. the application yes. is due. Yeah, so they have as much lead time as possible. Yeah. Um, and then that's the website for Schneider. Um, if you have checked in uh, in the front over there, we'll send you this slide <clears> there so you can have all the links. Okay. And then we'll have our contact information. Um, so for the summer uh, fellowship, these are the partners that we have. Uh, we have worked with these uh, organizations for multiple years, and they're all really great. The Schneider Fellowship positions get some of the best reviews that I see. Like I oversee a lot of corner quarter positions, and these are just great reviews years year after year. Um, so as you you see EDF, um, we have a representative who will be speaking later this session. We have nine positions for the summer, um, and RDC has seven. Um, NRDC, the application process is a little bit different. It's not on solo, which some of you might be happy about. <laughs> You're actually applying directly through the NRDC website. All the links are on the, um, on the page um, on the website. So you will actually be filling out an application directly on NRDC's portal. They're doing that so that they can capture information and like, send you updates and stuff if they have future opportunities. So that's why we're doing it that way. Everyone else is on solo. Um, RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute, they have one position. Of concern centers two, and then U.S. Climate Alliance one, and U.S. Green Building Council has three. It's a mix of technical roles and like policy roles and like you know uh, research roles. So something for everyone. There's a communications role somewhere in there. So you know definitely take a look through all of them. I'm sure that there you find if you're interested in this um, climate um, and energy area, you'll find something that would appeal to you. I'm pretty sure we have a pretty good diverse set of portfolio positions this year. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, in terms of the one-year role, like I said before, they are the one-year roles are always placing at one of the headquarter offices of the NRDC. 
uh, at they, those roles do tend to have a balance also of sort of more technical <laughs> and maybe more policy based, uh, given sort of NRDC's specializations. Um, I will say this time, I do not have specific job descriptions that I can offer because I have not yet received them for reasons that are not worth going into. Um, so we know that you are interested or might one day be interested. So you will receive that information when it does go live because you are here, you have your information. Um, but yeah, but they are placed at NRDC and they tend to be uh, a balance that will help, sorry, managers within that will really also try to find projects and things that cater to your interests in addition to things within the job description. They tend to be a bit more flexible. Um, so <coughs> do apply if you have any interest in uh, the qualifications um, for those roles as well. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to Thomas, who actually did one of the EDF summer positions last year, and he can give you an overview of what he did and what the application process was like for him. So I'm going to turn it over to Thomas to speak. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm, Thomas. I'm a junior studying energy science and engineering. Um, this summer, I worked at EDF, which is Environmental Defense Fund. They have nine positions in a lot of different areas, from like, energy stuff um, to like fishery stuff. So whatever floats your boat, feel free to like look at those positions. Um, I was out of the SF office. I'm from the Bay Area too, so it was really nice to be able to like commute in. Um, EDF is really hybrid. A lot of their work um, is either hybrid or remote, so that's a really big advantage. Um, I was on the California Energy team, so I was working on a really small team with just my boss, one other intern from another school, and then um, my boss has another um, person working under him. And so I got to really work with them a lot on California energy projects specifically. So there was like a hydrogen project I was like reading reports about. Um, I was also learning about offshore wind in the state. Um, I got to go to the California State Assembly um, and see how their legislative process works because um, EDF does lobby at that level. Um, and then my main work was focused on um, helping supporting their work on developing Western electricity markets. Um, so that work was a little more technical. Um, when I was applying into it, I knew it was a little bit more technical and I had some kind of background knowledge on it. I think being able to kind of talk about how I'm like interested in energy and ask targeted questions was kind of how I stood out in the process. Uh, if you guys have any questions about EDF internships, come find me after. Really recommend. Anyone have one or two questions now? About any of the above, including <laughs> including things regarding EDF. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any advice? on uh, our journey through this application process? Um, the application is live, so you can just go onto the website and click through it. You'll just have to like upload your resume, transcript. So just start like working on those stuff. Um, <coughs> all the application is, so there's really like no other way to like optimize it. Um, so just put your best foot forward, yeah. show a lot of interest. Review your resume before you submitted. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think I was used to like applying to stuff, so I have like it kind of down. Um, but Career Center offers like resume review. Um, or the careers team. <laughs> which is us. Yeah, well, the Colorado Board of Peer Advisors. We have a lot of resources if you would like to take advantage of them. The Colorado Board of Peer Advisors can also read over your cover letters and applications. Um, so can the careers team and then the process for your career ed. So lots of resources for you. Yeah. Yes. I have another question to share. Um, I always struggle whenever applying to things of whether or not to upload a one page or resume or a two page resume. Uh, is there a preference for the Schneider Fellowship? And which one? Uh, my feeling is that if you can say it in two pages, you can probably say it in one page. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood that someone is going to turn to page two, especially if it's a physical thing, much less a digital thing, is lower. Uh, that is, so generally, I would say the top, the things you want to you want to make sure that someone sees absolutely should be on the first page. Um, 
if something says one or two pages, great, you can do two pages too. And I think that's something like Schneider. So in general, job applications, cold call, like throwing things, I would say always a one page would be my preference. Uh, for something like Schneider, where all parties are opting in to something that is mentorship focused, like they really want to get to know you, they're going to read the second page. I think. So uh, I would say for this setting, one or two pages is fine. Make sure that your the first experiences you want your reader to see are very clearly itemized on page one. Uh, but it's nice to be able to share more, show that you're a three-dimensional person, and maybe the page two um, is that space. Maybe a longer answer than you expected, but uh, that's my feeling. Yeah, yeah. And I forgot to say, uh, for both the summer and the year long, it's open to all enrolled Stanford students, so from frosh to doctoral students. Yeah. Um, except for RMI, they are not taking doctoral students. Everything else is like open to everyone. But that doesn't mean we you know that means that doesn't mean that only graduate students get it, right? Like Thomas is a junior now, so he was a sophomore when he applied. So definitely, you know, put your best best foot forward, as we said. Yeah. 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 Sorry, on that note, and sorry I was late and I just walked in okay. to get presentation. Um, how common is it for doctoral students to be able to do a fellowship that also is in line with their research so that their advisor will let them? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, we did have a doctoral student last year. Um, you do have to give up the Stanford part of your research grant to do this. So mm -hmm. you do have to talk to your advisor about it. Mm -hmm. And But what she did seemed completely in line with what she was studying. And she had a really, really wonderful experience and it kind of so it is possible <laughs> um, and her advisor was supportive um, so we do see that we don't see as many doctoral students participate but we have seen them and by the give up the Stanford <coughs> you mean like you give up your you know how you have that guarantee like research grant every quarter I've, I've, I've you know, you <coughs> your through. stipend mm -hmm. yeah your stipend mm -hmm. yeah you're not going to get that if you're if it's a it's a weird way that doctoral programs will incentivize getting external funding is that they will say, Great, you got that funding external. What a great accolade. Sorry, I'm speaking in a tone I don't need to be because I was I did it anyway. Um <laughs> but but like if you can get funding from another source, it'll be like, great, then you don't need this funding for us from us for now. So like for that quarter, mm -hmm. you could get this money instead. Instead of instead of, instead of the Stanford <laughs> director. Yeah, this is a little <laughs> so you that's a consideration for doctoral students. So that's, that's not unique to this. One. That's just we only had one participate last summer, but it was like life changing for her. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> like, okay. So, and it's sorry, just, added, it can't be added on. It can't something. be added on. It would be instead of. Yes. Oh, but that's like, that's better than what I did. Which is, okay. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it's better. And it's yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, let's, should we hold questions until the end? Yes, we have we have a few more slides that we want to get through, but we, we do, to, yeah, but then we will leave space for questions. Yes. So that is why we're here. <laughs> also, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so to share a little bit about the one year uh, program, something I did not note earlier is that in terms of eligibility to to say uh, and to speak to the one year as as Valerie speaking to the summer long. Um, this is degree agnostic, year agnostic. If you're willing to take a gap year from an undergrad program and you still want to throw your hat in the ring. If you're willing to do that, like you can still apply. So truly apply regardless of where you're at. If this is something that is appealing to you, um, the other fellowships that I that I uh, direct are specific to being your last year of undergrad or in your co year. That is not true for the Schneider One Year Fellowship. So just to say, it is 12 months, and if that's an appealing thing for you at any stage of where, wherever you are right now, please do apply. Um, like I said, to be determined which locations and also job descriptions. Sorry, I don't have that information for you at this time. Uh, not worth going into, like I said. But let me uh, be proud of our 2024, 2025 fellows who are currently doing the work, uh, Ellen Norman and David Lee, who are respectively working at the San Francisco and D.C. offices. Uh, they're doing really great stuff. Uh, could share more about each of their projects and things like that. But these are their titles. Uh, the Western Equitable Clean Energy and Climate Fellow in the San Francisco office and the Policy Analysis Fellow, uh, which I think are the DC office does a lot more at the policy level, thinking federally. Um, San Francisco office does more things with oceans, does more things um, that are that are coastal, regional to California or the West Coast. Um, and then just a little a little aside from uh, 2015 Schneider Fellow, uh, the this fellowship has had a pretty lengthy lineage. Um, the, I think some of the first fellows before it was called Schneider for like 2005, 2006. So there's 
uh, a pretty deep pool of individuals who have stayed in the work. Uh, and over 50% of them have like been offered roles or continue working at NRDC, whether directly after the fellowship or some years later. Um, so it's a this is a big invite. This is a really big pathway to continuing the work, I would say. Um, and to that, where where do those, so the first thing is what I just articulated, but here's some other places just to put some names of things in front of your eyes. Um, other Schneider one-year fellows here are places that they have worked or currently work, uh, work now. Give that a few more seconds and then we can move forward. And then briefly, uh, I would say that NRDC is really, really good at giving opportunities to do cool travel. Uh, and to work together. So these are the, the this is the 2021 cohort on the left and the 2024 cohort of two on the right. Uh, this is Annie and Bella. Annie and Bella were on NRDC's dime, sent to South Korea, sent to Seoul to do, uh, to participate in this, this conference that was happening about electric transportation, which is a really great experience that they wrote about. And there, this is what the screen cap is from, and their expert blog, uh, that they, they have their own sort of profiles that they put things out publicly on, which is an amazing portfolio tool, um, to be able to have that hosted on NRDC's website to be given the sort of license and autonomy to produce that sort of thing is really, really neat. And that's a, fully a standard thing of being a year-long fellow. Um, and then just COP26 and, and 2021, the four fellows were sent to Glasgow. So photos of that. Okay. Um, I think we are going to turn over now to our guest on Zoom, um, who is uh, from EDF, Gianella. She is going to be joining us and talking to you all and giving you an overview about EDF's internship program um, and what they're looking for in candidates. So feel free to ask some of those questions that you're asking us as well. So I will turn it over to Gianella now. Hi, thank you so much, Valerie and Ben, for inviting me to come talk a little bit about EDF and our opportunities. And thank you, Thomas, for the kind words. I don't know if he's still in the room. I couldn't see him, but yes. it was wonderful to hear him. Um, throughout that. So yeah, I'm just going to share a little bit about EDF and the internship program that we have to offer for summer 2025. You could go to the next slide, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica, for handling the slides as well. Um, but yeah, EDF, just a very, very brief overview of our organization. Our vision is a vital earth for everyone and that it kind of unifies the entire organization. And we are able to, or we are trying to do this through three pillars or what we call our three S's, which is stabilize the climate, strengthen the ability of people and nature to thrive and support people's health. Go to the next slide. Um, just a quick, quick overview on how we do that. We have eight focus areas. You can see those on the right over there. Agriculture, <laughs> water and food, methane, clean energy, transportation, fuels and feedstocks, fisheries and oceans, forests, and healthy communities. And of course, those are all very, very large and very vague topics. So we have multiple project teams, multiple work streams under each of these focus areas, working on different things from research and science to policy, advocacy, um, community engagement, and more. We do this I think Thomas mentioned earlier in a hybrid setting. So we have folks that are going into offices and folks working remotely. So in the bottom left, you can see our US offices listed there. Um, the biggest one that probably pertains to you all is the San Francisco office, those two photos. Left one is of Thomas with one of our intern ambassadors, Kate, in the San Francisco office, which has an amazing view. I'm very jealous of that view. Um, and then to the right is a photo of our San Francisco interns a couple years ago with our president, Fred Krupp. They did a quick breakfast meeting with him. Um, so that was really cool. And he was able to go out to the San Francisco office. Um, but we also have offices in other parts of the U.S. and we also have global offices. We are a global organization, which is really great. And although our internships are U.S. based, um, some of the work that you get to do sometimes, um, some of our opportunities do cross over into some of our re other regions and other countries that we work in. So um, that's just a little bit about EDF as an organization. And next, I want to jump into our summer internship program. So all of our summer Schneider Fellows are um, invited and 
able to participate in our pretty dynamic internship program, if I do say so myself. Um, we offer a speaker series, which happens twice a week, where we invite uh, experts and EDF staff all across the organization to come share a little bit about the work that they're doing, the projects that they're working on, as well as their career path. Um, just as another way to get interns um, some face time and opportunities to learn a little bit more about the organization and different projects that are happening in the climate space outside of the team that you're regularly on. We also have professional development opportunities. We really try to tailor these to each summer's audience. So we typically ask and form um, these professional development opportunities throughout the summer, depending on what folks are interested in. This past summer, we had a member from our talent development team come in and talk a little bit about navigating the modern and hybrid workplace, how what it means to kind of start your career hybrid or remote, um, and ways to kind of maximize efficiencies, productivities, and, and really start off on the right foot. And we also had a member of our talent acquisition team come in talk about navigating the job hunt and what it means, you know, what it means to kind of navigate it after an EDF internship, some tips and tricks to navigating the the career paths um, that some of our folk, our interns take after their internship. We also offer a lot of so social events throughout the summer. The offices will have their own independent um Social events, I think the San Francisco office a couple years ago went on a hike together and then had lunch. We have had intern groups go do laser tag, museum visits, many different things, depending on what you're interested in. And we also have virtual events that is in, that all interns can join. Um, we did a virtual escape room this past summer. We have a peer networking social where you kind of get to, go to know other interns, just a bunch of different social events to get to know your peers as well as other EDF staff. We also celebrate National Intern Day, which falls on the last Thursday of July every year. And this is just a time to celebrate our interns and um, we do a bunch of different initiatives. We buy lunch and we um, do special shout outs and we also distribute swag. So that's always a really exciting day. We also do social media spotlights. I'll plug our Instagram after this where you can kind of see those. But um, yeah, we definitely try to celebrate and spotlight and highlight the work that our interns are doing while they're still at EDF. Another way we do that is through our intern symposium at the end of the summer where interns have the opportunity to present on the their projects and the work that they've been doing throughout the summer. Um, and it's a great way to share a little bit about what you're working on and the impact that you've made at the organization and to celebrate that. And all EDF staff, as well as partner program partners are invited to that symposium. We have intern ambassadors, which are volunteer EDF staff that um, come in and are mentors and just uh, another friendly face for our interns. They You get assigned an intern cohort every summer um, and there's a mentor that helps you just kind of navigate um, your summer. It's just an additional support for you outside of your day-to-day -day team and your supervisor. And then something else unique that we do is um, our president, Fred Krupp, was actually an intern back in the 1970s, and he's now president of the organization. So he's a big supporter of our internship program and um, loves to meet all of the interns every summer. So um you saw the photo of him in the San Francisco office. If you're, if he's unable to go in person, he still meets everyone virtually as well. So these are small group sessions where just casual conversation, get to pick the brain of the president of the organization. Um, the top photo right there is Fred with the New York office this past summer. Um, and then just to go through the photos, the DC office did a bingo activity. And then they also got invited to an EPA event um, early on in the summer. So it was a great opportunity for them. So lots of different opportunities um, that make up our summer internship program if you choose to join us this summer. And then this is just a quick list of some of our Schneider positions we've had previously. This isn't, um, not all of these positions are um, available again this summer, but I just kind of wanted to share with you all some of the things that Schneider interns have done in the past. Uh, we had a blue carbon research uh, fellow who researched existing blue carbon sequestration projects. 
with a focus on mangrove habitats, and they were able to conduct interviews with stakeholders within those carbon sequestration projects and <laughs> synthesize their findings for EDF staff research. Our air quality research intern worked with our economics team to write a technical manual for the local air management plans project in India. So they worked, I think they were based in New York, but they were able to work on a project that um, worked with our India team. Our Transform Petrochemicals intern worked with EDS staff to define methodology and identify data sources to critically evaluate mass balance accounting and life cycle analyses related to the conversion of plastic waste to fuel or advanced recycling. Um, our small scale fisheries intern got to work on social media strategies to increase engagement on the small scale fisheries hub um, and supported the, the small scale fisheries hub maintenance of its resource library. And then our U.S. Federal Climate Innovation intern uh, worked with the team to research levels of federal spending dedicated to innovation in different sectors. Um, and they were able to build a data set that would help synthesize key insights for EDF advocacy. So I just kind of want to share these five out of the many that we've had in the past few years um, as just an example of the different types of internships there are, different types of work that there are, and the different types of topics within the climate space um, that EDF has to offer. I didn't include uh, Thomas's position here because I knew he was going to talk about it, but we also have um, opportunities in energy transition if you're interested in that. But yeah, just a whole a plethora of different positions. So I highly recommend you taking a look at all of them. I know there are a lot of them, but they are all different and hopefully you'll find some that stand out to you <laughs> as a special opportunity. Then the next slide, if you could. Uh, this is my last slide. If you're interested in keeping up with us, that first link is um, to our internship web our internship page on our website. If you're just interested in seeing a little bit more about what our program looks like, there's information that I just recent previously shared about the the internship program. If you just need a refresher or want to reference it um, during your search, um, I will say just as a note, there is an a link on that page that like says like open internships here. Um, those are our publicly available internships that anyone can apply to. Those will not include the Schneider ones, so please follow the Schneider um, opportunities that Valerie mentioned earlier to find those ones. Um, we just have our general open to anyone positions available on that link, so just a caveat there. If you have any questions at all, interns and fellows at edf.org is the place to go. My team, we're a small team of three, um, and we always have our hands on that email. So if you have any questions, just know you'll be reaching a real person and we will get back to you as soon as we can um, with any um, support that we can offer. And then lastly, what I mentioned earlier about social media, if you're interested in seeing a little bit more of our program, go to at EDF interns and there are intern spotlights and highlights from this past, from the past couple of summers. Um, just like a little inside look on what our internship program looks like. So I'll definitely stay in touch. And that is all for me. Thank you for having me. question. I guess the first question would be for Gianella. Uh, what are you all looking for in terms of a successful applicant for your Yeah, programs? of course. I think you've all mentioned it already. Um, Definitely, I think all of our positions have request a cover letter and a resume. So we're looking for that. Make sure you're tailoring your cover letters to the positions. I know there are a lot of them, but um, to the positions that you're applying for. And I think Thomas mentioned it earlier. EDF is full of very, very passionate folks um, in the work that they do. And they love to see that in uh, new colleagues as well. So any, um, you know, you may not have the experience, you know, concrete experience on that topic or, um, you know, like things to draw from from your past. But if you just show your passion and your interest, that is definitely something that is highly valued at EDF. Um, we're hoping to, you know, get interns that not only can do what the job description says, but is, are also passionate and growing in the climate space and learning. Um, that's why we have all the things that we're offering. Um, so we definitely love to see that in cover letters and interviews. I was wondering if you would be able to go through this year's like job descriptions and also where each of those positions are based. 
They're all on the Zolo, the oh, Schneider sure. website right now. They're live. Um, okay. Yeah, so there are nine of them, and there are you know all domestically based. Some could be fully remote, um, and then you could also some of them you can pick the office, I believe. So it's quite flexible, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I can't name them off off the top of my head because they're all a little bit different, but most of them are have the option to be remote, and most of them are also offered in the San Francisco office. Since I know. Um, all, a lot of our uh, Stanford candidates are interested in that. Uh, but then there are each individual position has a couple more offices that you're available to, to go to if you are interested. Any other questions for EDF for comments or for us in general? The floor is yours. Yes. I guess for Thomas, so um, when you applied to EDF, did you only apply to the one that you got into, or did you apply to other ones as well? Um, I'd have to look at my application. I think maybe two. I know I really wanted this one, though. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very, made sure to be on time for the interview. <laughs> um, For Thomas as well, uh, are you planning to go back to the EDF or back to like not our NGO work uh, after graduation or for future internships? Um, also, a really good question. Um, so I'm studying engineering, so I wanted to do something engineering this summer um, or like explore some other areas. My manager specifically is also very. Um, like big on like trying new things and college being about trying new things. Um, so for this summer, no, but um, I, I think there are probably a lot of people who are interested in going back. Um, my intern ambassador, Kate, who was in the photos, she was actually a former Schneider fellow. Um, and there was another Schneider fellow too at the office. So if you're thinking about like, going to do that like full time, talk to me later or I can send you her contact. Definitely an, an option, and I think there are a lot of people who do want to like, pursue NGO work. Yeah, we see a lot of former Schneider fellows who are now full time employees at all host organizations. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely a big alumni network there um, for this program as well. There's a LinkedIn group for Schneider fellows, it's a quite a good network. There are a number of also summer Schneider fellows who then also do the year-long Schneider Fellowship. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, yes, and there is definitely there are definitely lots of folks that we could we could help put you in touch with for prospective applications, especially for the year-long. Those are the 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 contacts I can offer. Certainly, that's yeah. Would it hurt us to apply to multiple at the same organization? I don't think so. You can rank up to three for EDF, for example, and most people do it. Um, very few people only pick one out of the nine, mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's, it will hurt you. And then each organization has their own. They're not going to see what else you apply to. So if you're so moved, you could apply to all of them. It's just time and effort, so it's up to you. <laughs> On the back end, what's typical is that if you've applied to multiple positions at the same, that they're probably represented by different managers or different teams. So like if they're, they will back behind the scenes they will say well here are our top rank what are yours because they want to make sure that they are not making offers to the same people too but if they're if you are a high rank choice for multiple they will figure out how to deal with that so like it's not going to hurt you it will only help to show that you have the, the skills and flexibility and interests in multiple roles in a compelling way uh, so when you are doing the ranking like on your application of the positions that you want to apply for how does that like play into the application process like how does the your ranking of positions and groups mm. i'll ask you know that question when you see an applicant for schneider and they rank something one versus three does that make a difference in the hiring manager's minds do you think or is it kind of okay from what i know and um experience it doesn't make a difference um we send them i send each hiring manager the, sa the same pool of all the applicants and it's up to them on on ranking who they want to interview so i don't think the ranking really matters too much until we get to the to the kind of that point that ben was mentioning about if there are multiple 
teams that are interested in hiring you, um, then we'll kind of go to your ranking and be like, okay, well, they rank this position higher. So we might, that factors into our decision on like which position we would want to hire you for. But in the initial application process, it doesn't make much difference for EDF at least. Could you talk a little bit more about the cultural differences between the offices? I know you were talking about in DC, it's more focused on policy and in SF, it's more like oceans. Could you talk about New York and Boulder, Colorado? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will say that there are, um, each of the offices do have these main focuses depending on because of location, like being on the coast versus being in DC. Uh, but there are folks that work in all the different teams um, in different offices, if they're interested in that. Our Boulder office is largely our legal and regulatory team. A lot of our legal um, fellows and our attorneys are in Boulder. Um, and then New York is our headquarters. So it's kind of a, it's a larger pool of a larger vi variety of folks coming into there. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's really generally, at least in New York, um, like a certain subset of folks that are going into the New York office. Um, and then we also have a Raleigh office that's um, got a handful of people out there and they work mainly on our coast and watersheds team. But they're all very welcoming. So even if you're not in those teams, um, still a great opportunity to be hybrid in one of the offices. Uh, for young fellows, like what year do people usually apply to and are successful in? Uh, I would say, so you are welcome to apply any year of any program. Um, I think that what ends up happening is that folks who are otherwise thinking about applying to jobs have a clearer pitch to make in their applications of, I've done this degree, I will be finishing up, this is the next step. Um, that is, that's just the historical precedence, but is that, does that sort of answer? Like, yeah, yeah. I would say often I see students applying who are about to graduate or in their final academic year, which is to say if you're graduating in June. Right. Um, but that is not a qualifying or disqualifying thing. That's just the tendency. Um, are any of the positions associated with the fellowship uh, limited to U.S. citizens only? This stipend comes directly from Stanford, so you're not an employee of EDF or an RDC. You're here basically, but you're getting the stipend comes from Stanford. So because of that, you don't actually don't we, we don't require work authorization. You can be an international student, a document student. That is the great thing about Cardinal Porter in general that anybody can apply, um, except for some of the Stanford and government like U.S. Department of Defense kind of thing, where the organization requires citizenship. We're open. Basing off his question, um, how mm -hmm. likely is it for Frosh to get into the summer fellowship? That's a great question. Uh, we have seen Frosh. We had some Frosh last year, mm -hmm. but it is one of the more competitive programs just because we're open to all years. Um, so depending on what the uh, folks are looking for in terms of like technical level and things like that, um, it'll just vary. But we have had Frosh get it. Um, but I wouldn't just apply to Schneider and that's it if you're a Frosh. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, so so definitely apply. Um, but I have also seen folks apply multiple times and then get it, you know, when they're further along in their separate journey. So yeah, keep us in mind. To, to clarify, I was, because I felt like the question was directed to me, I was speaking specifically of the year long. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I was got it, got it, got it. Awesome. Okay. Well, like for year long, they have to take like a gap year, right? So if they wanted to. If you were applying without having yet finished your degree program, you would need to take a gap year in order to do the year long. Um, the tendency that I've seen is for folks to choose not to do that and to apply when they are about to graduate. And perhaps you have applied to both a co-term program and you've applied to different fellowships, including this one, and you get the fellowship and you get the co-term, you can defer the co-term, you can't defer the fellowship. So I have seen with some frequency, uh, uh, recipients of the fellowship will defer the co-term, do this for a year, then return to Stanford to do their co-term year, for instance. Um, so yes, that's, that's that. Just to make sure the work that would be done is that what usually have to employees, because I asked, from what I know, international students only have yeah, we have an email from Backtalk last month that says <laughs> international students can participate. You don't have to do all BTC, PT, anything. Okay. So, um, but I would encourage you still to check in with them after you get it, just to double check because everyone's visa status is different. But in my experience, it's been fine. Yes, yes. 
based on an earlier question, what sorts of work does the Austin office focus on? Yeah. Sorry, was that was that for me? Yeah, I could just break it up a little bit. Sorry. Um the question was what does the Austin office focus on? Yeah, I think the Austin office is similar to the New York office where there's multiple different um teams working there. It is a smaller office, um, but we do have a Texas State Affairs team. So a lot of the Austin office is our Tex Texas State Affairs, but again, um, it is a little bit like our New York team where there's there's different teams, whoever's in the local area can come in and work there. We have a, one more slide to show. Bring up that up. Um, we'll be sitting around if you have any questions. I just wanted to keep us So just wanted to point out that there are a lot of different summer fellowship opportunities um, that are related to sustainability, climate, energy. Some of these are listed there. If you have checked in, we will send you the slides. You will get this. Um, so definitely check all of those out. Most deadlines are actually in early February for the summer. So keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about your summer planning um, for the yes yeah, for the summer opportunities. And then uh, if you are thinking about year long fellowships, post grad opportunities, talk to me if you haven't already. In addition to the Schneider Fellowship, we do have other fellowship programs that sort of offer that start to public service career that are about a year long uh, that you can do things associated with environmental uh, anything. Uh, so there's some flexibility built in to some of those. So. But, so yeah so thank you for coming we just wanted to keep everyone on time um and good luck on finals uh please apply remember the deadline january 28th email me and ben if you have any questions um and we'll stick around for a few minutes to answer any individual questions as well thank you.